general reminder, this is a recorded session. So if you have questions, please uh, use the mic in the middle towards the end for the Q&A. Um, other than that, it uh, should be similar to everything else we've done. Um, so the presentation is how to put a pipe through a natural park, partnership and communication. Um, and we have a uh, Jadine Stenslin that's gonna present that for us. And uh, Jadine is a PE in the in principal engineer at Clean Water Services. She's a PNCWA Stormwater, uh, Stormwater Committee past chair. She has 25 years of professional experience in municipal engineering, including prior work uh, experience as a deputy city engineer. She has a MS5 in, oh, sorry, MS in the bio uh, resource ecology engineering with a minor in civil engineering from Oregon State University, a BS in environmental engineering from Paul, uh, Cali Paul, uh, Cal Poly, uh, LSO, and a professional certificate certificate in river restoration from Portland State University. And she is also a level three operator, has a level three operator certification. So uh, without further ado, uh, Jadine. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all for staying here. I know it's um, late on a Tuesday afternoon, so I appreciate um, seeing so many people out there. I thought I might be speaking um, just to a couple. So thank you for showing up here. Um, I do want to kind of preface this, that um, this tool that I'm going to be demonstrating is on the um, on the web. It's cloud based, and um, just the way it's set up here in this room, I won't be able to do that from up here. So I knew there might be a technical difficulty. So I have screenshots that I'll go through here, and then just like if you were here at the two o'clock meeting, I'll go over behind the desk there and actually use the tool from the cloud. So just know that that's what we're going to do. So agenda-wise, I want to say that um, we are actually just finalizing this project. I have Wei Denny here, um, who is our construction phase manager that's working through the construction of this project. We put the final stick of pipe in, um, and we're just kind of cleaning up the site, doing some stream um, improvements, and um, starting our establish plant establishment phase. So today's discussion is really about the communication tool that we put together on the front end of this project. Um, because we'll be back talking about this amazing project next year um, and get into more details about that. Um, so I will give a little bit of project background just so you know um, kind of the aspects of the innovative approaches that we took that we're demonstrating in the, um, in the communication tool. I'll talk about our project um, drivers and our objectives and give a schedule so everyone kind of knows where we are. And then um, the majority of this presentation will be about the communication tools that we use. So um, we're Clean Water Services. Um, this is our mission statement. Um, our primary role is to treat wastewater, manage stormwater, and protect public health. Um, we lead through science, and um, we like to use innovation to um, treat water, preferably with vegetation and um, natural systems. And so you'll see us demonstrating that in this project. Um, we also manage stormwater, um, surface water, water security, and river flows. So we do a lot of stuff over in uh, Washington County. Um, let's start off with some geography. Clean Water Services um, serves urbanized Washington County, which is west of Portland, I'm um, in Oregon. And you can see here, oops, two of these. Um, you can see here through um, the black outline, that's the Tualatin Basin, it's our watershed um, that we serve. And the little blue dot there is where the project is located. Um, so it's at the bottom of the Cedar Mill watershed, um, which serves all the way from the West Hills of Portland. Um, I have a pointer here. The West Hills of Portland um, through Cedar Mill watershed um, down into Beaverton Creek and then to the Tualatin River. Ultimately, all of our wastewater, all of our stormwater is going through the Tualatin River. And um, so this is very important to us um, to manage. I wanna start off this presentation um, that ultimately, like I said, this is about the communication tool, but um, I'm gonna do a little bit of an overview of this project. Um, if we would have approached this project just as a sanitary truck project, um, we would have just been looking at replacing two miles of pipe, up, upsizing it to a 48 inch pipe, going through a floodplain in an existing alignment. Um, it is 30 feet deep from the right of way. so. If we wanted to move it out, which we looked at alternative analysis early on, 
that we are modeling. Could we move it out to the right of way? Would that be beneficial? Would we need to put a pub station in? Um, would we want 30 feet deep sewers? Um, or do we wanna stay in the corridor, which is considered um, a crown jewel of uh, Washington County. It's THPRD or Tualatin Hills Park and Rec's um, nature park. We have over a billion visitors to the nature park every year. Lots of trails, um, people interacting um, through educational experiences, just through um, uh, health and fitness, and um, just the ability to have the wellness of being there. So if we were gonna impact this area, it's gonna impact a lot of people that live in our community. Um, we knew that we could get in there, take care of the sewer pipe. Like I said, there's already a alignment in there. We could follow that. Um, we weren't gonna have any impervious area um, added with this project. So we didn't necessarily have to do anything with stormwater. Um, and so we were like, well, is that the, the approach that we wanna do? It was easy to identify um, those drivers for us from, the sewer, from a sanitary perspective. Right? We want a long lasting pipe. We want to improve maintenance access. Right now, it was put in in the 70s. They didn't really think about how we were going to do TV, CCTV and stuff. So we want to make sure we had good access. So we were being thoughtful about that in our planning. And we want to make sure that we've protected our infrastructure so that it wasn't impacted by flooding because it is in a floodplain and that it wasn't impacted by um, erosion from the creek coming through there. As climate change, uh, climate change happens, we're going to see increased, um, increased flows maybe more intense flows. So maybe we'd see faster moving water through here. So how can we manage the stream corridor, manage some of the, that? And we wanted to meet the needs of Washington County. We also thought about, well, okay, if we're gonna get it into the stream corridor, let's engage all of our really smart people and talk about stream resiliency. So we wanna make sure that if we're in the crown jewel, that we leave it better than when we found it, um, that we provide healthy riparian and stream corridors that we go in there and make sure that we're working through um, invasive plant management, putting in natives, things that are gonna be very resilient through climate change, that we're looking at stream channel complexity as well as floodplain connection. So we're gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate some of the side channels that we worked on, the large wood that we put on the floodplain. And then as we were going through this process, we realized, well, there's a lot of partners out there that we could do, not just our internal partners and experts, but who else um, is doing projects in this area? What's Washington County doing with their transportation? Do they have some stormwater needs that they need to meet? Um, could we help them with their hydro modification? We also write next to a bunch of industries. Um, so this is Reesers over here on, on the side and they have, um, as you'll see in a, in a moment, um, they're right next to the creek. We wanna make sure we're not inundating them if we're gonna get into the stream, but we wanna have more capacity of the stream that we're not impacting them more. So we had to balance the needs of that stream complexity with the needs of the, the property owners that are around us. So this is kind of an overview um, at the bottom left-hand side, kind of the bottom of our project. The creek is the blue line kind of going through that Cedar Mill Creek. And the blue swath is the 100-year floodplain, FEMA's um, floodway. And then the green swath is the 100-year floodplain. And you can see that some of research buildings are actually in the floodplains. So we had to be thoughtful about what could we do in that area above there. The, um, the um, primates meter rail goes right through the project. So we need to make sure that we weren't impacting them for their daily commutes, commuter rail trains. Um, we were gonna have to um, directional, uh, we we're gonna have to do the, um, the crossing underneath that without impacting um, the rail system. Um, we have their bus station. So right there, the garage is right adjacent to this area. So we need to make sure that um, all of our truck traffic wasn't gonna be impacting all of their transit vehicles coming and leaving the garage. Um, and we also have PGE's um, maintenance yard and a big um, transformer area for them. And so um, we knew that we were gonna have a lot of partners to work with and try to meet all of their needs and goals and make sure that they were aware of our project and what we were doing. So Clean Water Services worked really closely with um, Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District. Majority of our project over a mile um, was through their park, through their jewel, and we were gonna be impacting it. So we wanted to work, work closely with them um, to make sure that we were meeting their needs. Uh, we also were working with, we decided to work with Washington County. They had a huge transportation improvement project to um, improve, widen um, all the roads 
um, around the area north of us um, because Nike and the city of Beaverton were doing a lot of improvements. Um, and so um, they had a lot of stormwater requirements to meet um, for all that additional impervious area. When we looked at the modeling, what we noticed was that since we're at the bottom of the basin, um, we, that extra runoff that was coming from their stormwater um, impact was, um, <laughs> the, the extra water was coming, was only increasing the stream capacity by one or 2%. And so by working together, instead of them buying property to put a large storage uh, pond on, that the property values here at that time were a million dollars an acre, um, we were able to work with them to manage their water quantity requirements through hydro modification, through improvements through the creek um, to meet their needs. And so we worked through an intergovernment agreement with them to do that. And we worked with a lot of the regulatory agencies to make sure that you know, this kind of new innovative approach could work and that they were willing to be flexible with us so we could demonstrate that it would work. So in the end, we, got our, we met all of our drivers for our sanitary project. We're replacing that sanitary line. Um, we're significantly enhancing our environment and the uh, wildlife habitat in that corridor. This is a generational investment for us. One of our largest projects that we've done, $15 million uh, that we did over the last couple of years. It also doesn't only meet our infrastructure needs, but also the community needs, because we met with them, found out what they needed, and some environmental needs. We planted thousands of plants, or we will be planting thousands of plants, trees and shrubs, and we um, implemented this with really strong partnerships with all of these agencies that I mentioned. It was a two, it was a two year construction project. That, like I said, we're just finishing that up here in the fall and we'll have a lot more information for you next year. So instead of focusing on pipes, we, we broadened our impact. Um, we moved from a mindset of less impact to less disruptive and less invasive. And that was our thought process going through there so that we could have um, cost savings with coordination and leveraging funding with all of these agencies. I think our project benefits that were coming out of here are that are important to uh, uh, recognize is that PHPRD and our community that we're part of has improved trails and boardwalks. Um, we were going to have to remove these old boardwalks that were hard for THPRD to maintain um, to put in our sanitary line. And so I'm not even sure if when we removed them, if they were going to stay in place. They wanted some new ones to meet their new standards. So we worked with them and we brought those boardwalks up at a higher elevation so that water could flow through there and um, not get impacted on there and be able to spread out over the floodplain more, um, not um, inundate their, their, walk, their boardwalks and trails so that the community could use them all year long. And so it was a great benefit to them. We, of course, improved. Um, the plant communities and made the creek more resilient through bank, um, stream bank enhancements that we did. Um, this is going to improve wildlife and aquatic habitat. And, and ultimately, we you know we're able to do our pipe pipe replacement, but the community is now better served because we're providing these benefits um, that are um, providing these mutual benefits. It was designed with the community input um, and coordination with all these partners to make it worthwhile for everybody. I know timeline's important. So something like this does take a lot of time. It's definitely a five-year process, if not more. When we first started talking about this in 2018, um, and we were just looking at our models and what our alternative analysis would be, we started talking to the community. And we wanted to do some um, invasive plant removal. You got to do that before you go in and um, actually be able to reestablish native plants. So we were doing that in 19 and 20. Um, and working with the regulatory agencies, it did take us um, over two years to take these different alternatives um, through that process. It was really long, um, but I think it's going to be worthwhile in the end. Um, we were able to, one of the innovative things that we did was um, we did tree removal before construction. So, um, and we listened to the community. They didn't want to have us just take the easiest path. Um, they said, you know, let's, let's, Keep as many of the large trees that we can. And so we actually redid the alignment a little bit, adjusted it here, narrowed it in so that we could keep some of the larger trees. And we were able to do that because we had that extra time on that front end. It ended up that mostly we took out trees that were less than 12 inch um, DBH and we left all of the larger trees. There are very few large trees that we had to take out. Again, we already had a corridor in there from about 45 years ago. So a lot of the trees were only about 45 years old. 
Um, and then all of the trees we plan to use, retain and use on site. So we were able to do that. So we had active construction last summer and this summer in water work period. So down there, the floodway. Um, and we do plan to be um, that continuing to work in here um, and for the long term because we've got monitoring and stewardship to do uh, for all the plant communities. So now I'm going to switch over to outreach because that's what this conversation is really about. How are we communicating with the public? So we did all the normal stuff. We had our website updated. We met with all the neighborhood groups. Uh, we had social media going. We put large project signs out on the roadways so people knew that there was a project happening. Why are there so many trucks on the road? And why am I late to work? Um, we made trail maps available. Um, we talked with different outreach groups about what was going to go on there. Um, we actually we, you know, planned to staff on site um, people to answer questions. We wanted to work with community groups to um, be participated there. And we wanted to do these coffees with the contractor once a month, but COVID hit. So we didn't do as many of those because there wasn't as much impact um, from the public as we thought there would be, but we were ready in case it didn't happen. So the most important messages we wanted to say was that you're going to have temporary disruption to your um, enjoyment of the park. We're gonna to try to minimize that. Um, there will be some intermediate closures um, so maybe, maybe the whole season closure, we kind of try to get that information out there. You are going to see equipment, you're going to see workers out here. This is what they're doing, you know, uh, make sure you know about it. We put extra signage at intersections of trails so people would know where um, they would have impacts and they would know what an alternative route is, um, as well as seeing like closures. And we did provide signage as well as flyers uh, by bilingual um, languages. So these are when, you know, these are the normal tools that you guys see out there. And um, we had our trails map. We used THPRD's trail map and then we updated it. So the brown, the brown lines are their trails. Um, like I said, we put uh, A-frames to say, okay, you can take an alternative route because if you wanted to go on one of the red lines, those, um, those trails are closed. You wouldn't be able to access those during different times of the season, different seasons. We also, um, we also did, our public affairs department did a really good job with these project sheets. They talked about what the project was, what the drivers were, why they were doing it, what the timeline is, um, and what the project benefits are. I think they did a really good job. So these were both um, available in a flyer as well as at our website. And then they did um, frequently asked questions, but um, bilingual, so those were available. So, you know, why is my trail impacted? Why, why are, are you going to save the trees? Those kind of questions that we got a lot. So um, we um, have this material too. So we did all the normal stuff, but we wanted to have more impact. We wanted the public to actually know what the aspects of the project were. We wanted to engage them in new ways. So they don't just say, oh, it's a construction project, ick, I want to stay away. But what is, what is happening out there? And um, so we wanted to make sure that they um, had a tool that, um, that they would be able to interact with and have some fun with. And so we talked about a lot of different ways that we could do that. And so, you know, we looked at our plan sheets, which as an engineer, I think they're beautiful. We actually even had a big color, kind of demonstrates each page and the closures and that kind of stuff. But the general public probably doesn't really like this. Um, it's, it's not very informative to them. And even if I get into a plan sheet, which I'm very excited about, you can see where the pipe alignment is, that yellow swath is the access road. Um, you can see where the creeks are, and it, that's all gonna be a lay down area, staging area that you see in the hatchwork. And then the little log, the little sticks, the little lines, those are gonna be trees that are on the floodplain. But again, it really doesn't demonstrate kind of what we're trying to get across to the public. So this is where we came up with the idea of having this um, 360 degree virtual reality tool. And it was a process. We worked through a couple of different ways to do this. We had an Oculus. We were thinking about that we would have these tools that you would put on your head and you could come to our offices and kind of be in it. Um, we had some things that you could do a video and see a sequence to it. We ended up on this one um, because we could put it on the bottom of the web. Everyone can use it. It's um, hopefully, hopefully it's very user friendly that you can figure out how to use it. And it demonstrated a lot of the information that we wanted to share with folks. So, um, like I said, I would normally show this to you, but I'm gonna just show you the screenshots and then I'll um, get in here and do it a little better. But just to kind of orient you to it, 
This is the landing page when you go to the website. It's an overview or plan view looking down. Um, on the left, you'll see Beaverton Creek. In the center, you see Vine Maple Boardwalk. And over to the right, you'll see Beaverton, uh, Beaver Pond Wetland. So those are the three locations that you can go to. In those locations, there's white circles, three of them. So if you look at Beaverton Creek, there's three circles or sites. So you can land on any of those three sites it, at the location of Beaverton Creek and be able to view 360 degrees at all three of them, kind of different views of what's going on there. And that gave us the opportunity to share a lot of information at one location about the, um, the work that we were doing there. So now we've got nine places you can go. And then we did three time frames. So the first one's gonna be um, during construction, then two years after, two or three years after, you know, after all the equipment's gone, and then finally seven to 10 years after what it will look like in the future. So just trying to orient you to what you can do here on this website. So you might get in here and just see the view, um, this kind of like existing condition. And then when you click on one of these, um, one of those dots from that landing page, it's gonna take you to one of the views. And so the, um, the yellow star, that's you know where, which location are you at? So in this one, we are at the Vine Maple Boardwalk and um, you can click on that. You know you're in view one because it says it up in the upper left-hand corner and then I'm um, in the purple star. And then the red star at the bottom is the, the time. So you're either during construction or at that um, linear line there two years after or 10 years after. And you can click on any of those spots and it'll navigate you to that spot. There's also the circles with the question mark. That's where we have some text. Let's say have that. Um, so I guess here, I just wanna demonstrate, we're um, talking about the heavy equipment that you're gonna see during construction. And there's an access road here. Um, where um, the trucks are traveling on and the pipe is next to it. So kind of demonstrate how do we install pipe um, when we're down in here. If you click on one of the question marks, it brings up a pop-up. So our public affairs team put together and crafted this language so that we could educate the public about well, what, are, what am I looking at here? What, what, what's the important things that we want them to see? So you click on the, you click on the question mark, it'll bring up a pop-up. Now what's changed is just the um, red star at the bottom, the timeline. So here, let's see, oops. Here you can see the tree that's right behind um, the dump truck there. It's still in this view, okay? So you can still see right where you're at, but now we're about two years after all the equipment's out, we put the boardwalk in, um, you can start seeing the vegetation growing and you can see, um, um, a little bit of inundation happening. We're starting to build up um, some of that, that water that's coming in here. You can do the pop-ups again. It tells you some you know, information that you would see there. And then last, the red star is now moved to the end of the timeline in 10 years. This is kind of the view that we, that we anticipate seeing 10, seven to 10 years from now. And um, we're still giving additional information. So here we're talking about you know, this, this piece of equipment is an easement tool. This is how we clean the sewers. So it's providing that education, what, what we do, that we built the boardwalk to be able to handle um, equipment weight. Something interesting, um, so it's, um, one of the interesting things about this is we were, we're using, it's a, it's a gaming environment. So they all have elements. So each of these trees are an element, each of the people or the equipment are an element that you could drag and drop into this um, environment. But there are no graphics of people of color. There's really no construction women. So there are some limitations to of this. Um, and the trees, like my, my biologists were very upset because these are not the trees that grow in our watershed. Um, but I, I tried to um, soothe them by saying, you know, this is really just a tool to help explain what's going on here. It's not um, a tool for, you know, botany. And, um, but, you know, they were like, well, those flowers don't bloom when those flowers do. And I was like, okay, so you really have to manage expectations when you're using these kinds of tools, because the scientists in us want to make it perfect. So kind of just um, comparing things to, um, you know, other technology, you know, we've used these kind of renderings that you see here on the left. 
to demonstrate stream bank um, protections, right? We've got uh, some large woody debris, debris being put in the channels, um, but now we can use, or we could use photos to kind of demonstrate, you know, you can put wood in here so that we don't have erosion. But now we've got this tool that you can actually visualize it. So here you see, um, this is actually the beaver pond um, view one. And you can see that we've, um, we're inside that channel, we're working in there. Um, in a couple of years, you're gonna be actually able to see the construction that we put in there. We put soil lifts along the channel. We've put in um, uh, live stakes um, laying in there so that they can grow and, and root really early and provide more vegetation. Um, you don't see any of the construction of access that you were seeing in the previous picture because that was our staging area, right? There's a lot of construction material there. It's all gone. You don't see the impacts of it. And then in seven, 10 years, this is what we anticipate that area to look like. You see the stream in there, but you don't see those live stakes anymore um, or the soil lifts. Everything is uh, vegetated. And then another one is um, you know, we wanted to demonstrate that we were um, piloting a hog fuel for a road access road. So um, we we're, we'll talk about like um, you know the improvements of doing this access road. This is actually a culvert that we were putting in the stream. We talk about that too. Um, but we knew that um, our, our ecologists wanted to put in something different and oak mats were pretty expensive. So we piloted the, um, the hog fuel road and it actually worked really well. We were able to pull that up and spread it out over the site um, and use that as mulch. And then we didn't have a gravel road that was really hard to, to remove. They were able to plant through it. So another technology that we used that was really cool that we were able to demonstrate and show. Um, this is just looking at the other way. So um, I'll do this on the screen since it works here. But again, showing those soil lifts, showing that live um, staking. And then in the end, um, 10 years from now, you won't see that. You can see some of the structure that we put in there. Um, so that's why there's wood there, um, but it's gonna be all vegetated and healthy. So I think, I just hope you guys will come out to our nature park and check it out um, next summer um, when it's really healthy and strong and come take a, take a look at it. I'm gonna run over there and we're gonna do some demonstration because I have a couple minutes here and then I'll take some questions. I'll be right back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so here's the, um, the jump off screen. When you go to the website, um, you'll see this. Um, you can, there's a button down here so you can make it full screen. So you would click that and get this view. Like I said, you can click on any one of these, um, these spots here. So I'm gonna click on that one. And it takes you to the view. They always start during construction. So you can kind of see the progression. Um, and so um, I can click on view three or view one from most of these locations. Got some analysis. And I can click on the question marks, maybe, and have the pop-ups come up. But then the other thing when you're actually in the tool is if you use the right clicker, you can do 360. So the, um, I just really wanna congratulate Mortensen's um, virtual insights team. They did such a fabulous job in creating this. Um, so you can see like, okay, all that wood that we took down that I mentioned, it, it's all laying here so that we could use it on site. Um, you can see the, um, the access road and the hog fuel, it's not gravel. You know, I think they did such a great job trying to um, demonstrate with the existing elements that they had. Uh, you see construction fencing, we have something on that. Um, and so anyways, you can go to all of these different places and do the full 360, woo, let me turn back. And so then you can click through view one or view two, it takes you there. Um, here's that first one that I showed you with the, 
the nice big dunk truck um, and the pipe being installed, kind of showing it. Um, and as I turn around, I can see the access road kind of coming up through there. So you get that depth of how long that is. It's two mile corridor. You see that we tried to narrow things up. We put that fencing in there um, to demonstrate that we were getting the smallest footprint that we could still with all the equipment that we needed. You know, we had our, um, our piles here. Um, we had, um, you know, all the equipment that we had to lay in here. It's a lot of work to construct this. And then you can click through maybe the different, um, the different time zones here. And see things. And then, and then in each of these, you can go to the different views, click over there, and you'll be in that same time frame um, from whenever you're clicking. So if it's like, oh, okay, this is what it's gonna look like. I don't see anything here. What did it look like during construction? Back there and you see, oh, well, this is exactly where the access road is. Okay, well, you know, am I gonna see anything here? No, in 10 years, we're gonna be completely vegetated and the creek is actually in this vegetation that's over here. So hopefully that um, you guys had a chance to get in there and kind of play with it. And if you have it, please go to the site, take a look at it. Um, have done there and um, worked with Mortensen to make it actually happen and our public affairs team to be able to um, actually articulate what was going on. So lots of people that were involved in this, um, lots of people at Clearwater Services, like I said, Mortensen's um, team was phenomenal in creating this for us. So anyways, I hope that that was really um, useful um, for you. I hope that you know, this tool, um, I, I saw Mortensen demonstrated at one of these PNCWA conferences, but it was mostly used for like inside of a treatment plant so that operators and folks could see what three-dimensionally, what a new building would look like or what um, electrical runs would look like. And so working with them to create this exterior plant environment was um, challenging, but a lot of fun to do. So let's see, can you go back to the... Okay, so this is where I was supposed to encourage you to come up, come and do some action. Please come out to Walton Hills Nature Park. Take a look at this site. Um, come to the website and like look around and see if you could see some of these actions that we did, very innovative actions that we did, whether it's the stream bank enhancements that we did um, to provide resiliency um, and complexity to the stream channels or the floodplain wood that we put on um, to provide some places for you know, habitat, as well as, you know, holding some water in there. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things that you'll hear about in this project, because um, like I said, we're just wrapping it up here um, over the next couple of months. Um, and we're gonna be able to demonstrate um, that to you guys. Um, but I really enjoyed having the opportunity to present the tool to you. Um, it was a fun to make. And uh, um, if you have questions, you can reach out to me. Um, or Mortensen, I think, also, because they, they did all the heavy lifting on this. So with that, I can take questions. Yeah, we have uh, about six minutes, so if we can get some questions, that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just uh, so everybody hears, uh, and for the people online, uh, the question was, what was the software that was used for the rendering? You know, I actually don't remember off the top of my head, and I don't think Josh was able to come today. Um, I can get that for you, though. Tom seems to know. No? Revit. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I have two unrelated questions. Mm -hmm. The first is, what is hog fuel? Oh, 
Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so hog fuel is um, a type of natural vegetation that um, is used. It's just cut coarsely cut up debris from like trees. So native trees we brought in. Um, it's large, so it could handle the impact of large construction uh, construction material um, and equipment running over it. Um, it. So it's like a bark mulch, but much larger. Okay, thank you. And the second mm -hmm. question is, do you have any sense of, of how much this site's getting used and, and how popular it is with your great pairs? Well, we, um, THPRD says that they have a million visitors a year um, that come through here. So it's been less during COVID, um, but we definitely have a lot of activity going on now that people are feeling more free to get out and um, enjoy the site again. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I was also wondering how many are using the tool? Like, do you have a sense of oh, how popular that is? And how many statistics people on that yet? No, that's, that's a good, that's something that I'll talk to public affairs about so we can Yeah, I'd be that. curious to know how, how, how people are using it, how, many, how long they're staying and what they're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll get some of those statistics. I'm curious if there's a lot of beaver dams in this area and if those were incorporated into the stream design at all or planned around um, in Tiger. There's a lot of beaver dams that get built on streamways and a lot of flooding that happens there. So just curious about this area. Yeah. So beavers are our best engineers, right? So we like to start structures, um, be thoughtful about where where we can provide food for them so that the dams happen in those locations. Um, but yeah, they're gonna create the structures that they want where they want them. Um, throughout the nature park, there's opportunities for that. And we do have beaver dams in there. Matter of fact, one of the locations is the beaver dam pond um, that we talk about. Um, we did want to encourage them to be down in the nature park and not up um, above TriMet because we didn't want it to have impacts. Um, sorry, we didn't want to have impacts to the um, Max Rail line or um, Reese's fine food if you guys eat potato salad. So, um, so yeah, we were trying to really be thoughtful about where we would put them and uh, to encourage food and um, building of their materials. Mm -hmm. Realize you're way past this, but just out of curiosity, did you guys look at pipe bursting at all to limit total impact on the area so you could get in spots in the design phase? Yeah, I mean, it was 36 inch pipe that we we're going to 48. Um, so, although I think there is some stuff out there like that, um, we, we actually kept our existing line in there so that in the future we would have a parallel line. Um, so that thinking about, well, 70 years from now, if we do have even more growth than what we're planning and build out right now, maybe they can take that, align and that alignment into account and they'll have parallel lines. Um, so it was part of our alternative analysis and we decided to keep it. I have a question for you. What's the emergency management look like for this since it's such a sensitive area? How do, uh, if there's a a clog or something like that. What does that look like in this area? Emergency management during construction. Uh, there, like if you get uh, uh, something stuck in the pipe and you have to go in there and you have to clean the pipe or something like that. Oh. You know, one of your culverts or maintenance wise. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so our maintenance crews uh, manage all of that, um, but it was a concern of ours during our design process. Um, we had long runs without a manhole because it was through the wetlands. And then in the wet in the wet periods, they were not able to get down there even to the manholes that were supposed to be accessed. And so that was one of the thoughts that we put in here was how can we get to um, our maintenance holes um, when you know we have inundation and expecting, especially if we're planning for future in more inundation in these areas. But yeah, we have we have process SOPs and stuff that they do. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your evening.